Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Tim Judge. He is the Senior Vice President and the Head of Modeling and Chief Climate Officer at Fannie Mae. Tim, good to have you with us. Thank you for being here. And our topic is this whole idea of climate change and the requirements for organizations to report and talk about how climate change and mitigation is affecting them. Fannie Mae has kind of a unique approach in this. Tell us what it is and give us a little bit of the context here. Sure, so disclosure is really important, but you know, at Fannie Mae, we think about climate change and the impact to the total sustainability of home ownership. So for us, it goes well beyond disclosure. It goes to understanding the risks now to the current home ownership and also to future impacts of climate change. Because I imagine it's not one thing for all of the zones in which housing exists that Fannie Mae might underwrite because you've got people living near rivers, near lakes, and you've got people at the top of mountains, on beaches. I mean, housing is not a single thing, is it? That's exactly right. Um, climate and resilience to climate is a local issue. What is the problems and the challenges of climate change in the Pacific Northwest is completely different from what it might be in the Gulf Coast. And so building out a program means you have to build out a program that's flexible for all different parts of housing in the U.S. Well, tell us how you do that. I mean, what, what does it mean for Fannie Mae to have a climate mitigation, again, aside from the reporting, but how do you mitigate it? How do you take what you've learned that you have to disclose and turn that into useful action? Yeah, first we start with understanding. And climate is a very difficult topic to understand. Uh, the analytics and the science behind it is always evolving. So that's where we start. And we start with understanding what climate looks like, as I said, in current state, but also future state, and really understanding all the different opinions out there. And there are many opinions on climate, whether you look at all the different models that are in the industry. And what we do is try to understand what is best practice, how to use all those models together to come up with our best estimate of what the risk is at the individual property level. It yeah, sounds like you don't get involved in what we should do about climate because that's a policy and there's a lot of debate over that. You just have to live with what effects are going on in the atmosphere, in the climate, and in the local weather as it exists. Well, we do a little bit of both. I would say, but the, always before you get to policy, there's always understanding, right? And we always view it as research, analytics, to get really informed before you determine what might be the best policy solution. Because a lot of organizations you know, deal with the climate question in their own way, certainly at the federal level, there are mandates to, for the Defense Department and other civilian agencies to understand what they need to do to mitigate climate change effects on their facilities and on their people and so forth. So I guess my question is, how do you, well, let's start with what sources of data that you have that you can feel that you get that understanding in a way that is reliable and trustworthy. Yeah, we start with partnering with as many of the institutions out there that are modeling climate and the impacts of uh, natural disasters. And really what we do is we're trying to learn from everyone. Yeah, we are in the early stages of climate analytics, I think in the United States. Uh, so we're taking that journey with everybody else. And that means getting the data that we need, getting the analytics that we need, and then working with everybody to say, trying to triangulate what is the best opinion on the impacts of climate. And it must get down more fine-grained than climate, because if you look at the biggest climate picture, well, the world is getting this many tenths of a degree warmer or yeah. this many tenths of a degree cooler, and versus 100 years, it's how many degrees. But that's really not very useful for, well, what's happening on the Florida yeah. Gulf Coast or what's happening you know, along the Mississippi River? Yeah. That's exactly right. So you have to break it down into what we would call perils. For instance, flood, but flooding, you know, for somebody on the coast is a lot different than, as you said, somebody inland near a river. And now, as you see in places like Montpelier, it's just rainfall. And so we have to break down, those are very different types of risks. You know, the housing, to some extent, has to be a little bit different. Uh, and that's just one peril. And then when you break it out, how are you dealing with wind? How are you dealing with wildfire? Like you mentioned, excessive heat and drought. These are all things that we have to break down and look at them individually. And I guess the modeling also has to involve the question of where does climate end and weather begin, because they're not exactly the same thing. Yeah, and that's, I took this job three or four years ago. Um, that is a constant battle, talking to people about the difference. Something happens tomorrow, it's climate. Well, it may be just the variability of weather, 
But we know, yeah, when we think about climate, we're playing the long game with climate and we see the gradual impacts of climate. And so I think we, we have to balance both. And you know, at Fannie Mae, we work on both. We work on understanding the long-term impacts of climate, but we also have a disaster response team that goes in after an event and helps people mm -hmm. after some of these natural disasters. Yeah, because there's real financial consequence for what you're doing here. Yeah, it's, we have close to 18 million loans and they're all over the United States, many of which sit in areas of high peril. And so it is a, both a safety and soundness, and I would call it as much a mission impact as well. This is, you know, climate is starting to impact sustainable home ownership. Sure, and just a quick side question. You are the head of modeling. Yes. What are the skills, what do you bring to this job to be a, a head of modeling? What do modelers do? Uh, they ask a lot of questions. Uh, they look at data and you know, my job is really to take all the core models of Fannie Mae and make sure they're, sitting, uh, they're hitting the business purposes that they're there for, for the customers. So you know, one of the unique opportunities I have because I have both these roles, is taking climate and putting it into how we think about any type of valuation at Fannie Mae. And I'm just curious what kind of computing power you bring to all of this. Lots. <laughs> yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of computing power. It takes a lot of data storage. Um, this is, you know, to understand climate and to understand modeling is a major investment. And you have to make the investment if you are going to get into this space. And by the way, do you have a statutory or regulatory obligation to do disclosure of climate effects on the portfolios that you manage across the housing industry? We always have to talk about what are the material risks to Fannie Mae. So that is, that is one requirement now. There is SEC uh, legislation that's happening right now that is soon to be finalized, which will, for SEC registrants, talk about how much they have to disclose on climate going forward. Sure, and the effects for Fannie Mae are both on investors on homeowners, on insurers, on reinsurers, and on the federal government, which also backs a lot of the disaster recovery. So you've got a lot of constituencies that, that care about this. Yeah, a lot of constituencies, uh, a lot of stakeholders too. So there's the positives, if everybody's, all of those folks are incentivized to do something about climate, uh, but they're all also impacted by climate. So we are trying to work with everybody across the industry to understand what their unique impacts are, but also how we can partner with them to make housing more resilient. And you mentioned that you're partnering widely, including on the many, many sources of data and the models out there that are looking at climate. And there's a lot of entrants, new companies coming into this field because they see it as a growth field. And you need to evaluate their claims, I imagine, on the accuracy, the efficacy of what it is they're offering. Otherwise, it's kind of a garbage in, garbage out situation. So how do, you, how do you work through those concerns? Yeah, and we don't take any model at face value, just as delivered. We spend a lot of time interrogating every single model. And as you said, there's always new entrants into the industry. We've always wanted to take what is a multiple model approach because we know all models have strengths and weaknesses. But if we can merge those models and kind of address their weaknesses and lean into their strengths, then we have a really good outcome and we have a better understanding of of the overall risk to the U.S. housing. Because I get a lot of press releases from these types of companies and very often they seem to fall prey, the companies seem to fall prey to the kind of human notion of your hope for expectation driving it is, driving what it is you do uh, in the way you approach a particular look at a problem to support the presupposed outcome. Yeah. And that's a bias you really have to keep your filters up against, I imagine. Yeah, you always have to start with the actuals, what we've seen, what we've observed. One of the challenges with climate is we're projecting into a world that we've never seen before. And so that is a little bit difference of understanding when somebody says, I do really well on projecting climate. There's not a real way to test that so much as to look at how they've implemented the, the models and is their theory appropriate? And then look at other people's opinions. Right, so one of the things we're trying to build is just basic intuition about when we say a climate event may look like, or the future may look like this in climate, what does that really mean to us? How do we think that number's gonna look like? Um, that's, that's hard work. Yeah, and I imagine you must have a way or a methodology of, let's say, aligning the baselines of different projections and models, because if one uses one, say, well, from 1969 to 1999 or 2019, that's my data base. Yep. 
base of the uh, information I'm looking at. Someone else changes it from 1975 to 19 or to 2025. I mean, that affects outcomes. That affects models. It affects the projects and the projected effects that you can expect. Yeah, we certainly try to keep as many inputs consistent as possible so that we're getting a fair con uh, consideration of each of the models. Uh, but it is a challenge, right? Because each modeling institution has a different data set. They've built it off a different data set. They have input data. They may, one institution may know a little bit more about the elevation of properties versus another institution. Uh, so there is a lot of work that we do to try to, as much as possible, make the models comparable so we're really seeing their view of the outcomes, not just their differences in inputs. And in creating the models and the risk profile that is what really is at stake here, do you also look at things like building codes and effects that have happened actually to housing? Just for example, many years ago, you know, Florida decided that garage doors should have a two by four bolted to the yep. back of them, you know, horizontally so they don't bend in as easily. That's a code now. That little micro change in a local building code could affect insurers, could affect outcomes of what happens in a high wind situation. Building codes are incredibly important. And you know, post -an Hurricane Andrew, there was a lot of changes in Florida. I would say you, you see the impacts of building codes in post Hurricane Ian that just happened recently down in Florida because building codes really do matter. And some of those small changes can have a demonstrable impact on the amount of damage on a property. Because if a climate is going to do some effect on the weather, you really can't control that. Right. I mean, you know, in the long term, in the short term, yeah. maybe not even in the long term, but you can mitigate the effects by, by taking these types of measures to ensure, you know, less damage should something happen. Yeah, really, we focus on three gaps when we look at how to address climate. It's the awareness gap. Do people just understand climate risk and what, what can they do about it? The second one is in the insurance gap. Are people insured for what they need? And then, as you noted, uh, the last one is resiliency gap. U.S. housing across the United States is not consistently resilient to current state climate. And we know as conditions get worse, that is only gonna get more problematic. So we spend a lot of time understanding uh, local building codes, how resilient the properties are, because that's where the damage, like you said, where you can actually impact the damage outcomes. Well, I might have you come out and look at that 75 foot pin oak in my backyard, because <laughs> every time the wind blows, we wonder what's gonna happen there. Yes. But you are clearly doing much more than the minimum requirement here on disclosure and on research. And tell us more about the motivation there and what other organizations like agencies or insurers should, should take away from this. Um, it's really important. Climate is really important. It's beyond disclosure. Disclosure is important because disclosure is the way that you tell uh, the industry what is important to you. Uh, but most important to us is always we start with the mission and the safety and soundness of Fannie Mae. Um, so we need to be proactive about understanding climate. We understand things are only going to get worse. It's going to be more impactful to U.S. housing going forward. So now is the time to do as much investment as we can to uh, investment in understanding and investment in creating partnerships so that we can start to be ready for a world that's going to get increasingly more challenging. And by the way, since you do all this research and inculcate all of this data and run all these models and tweak them and so forth, do you have publicly available outcomes and research reports that people might be able to look at? We do. Uh, we have not disclosed some of our risk publicly, uh, but we do do a lot of research and we put it out there because there is, you know, one of our jobs is to be not only a steward of Fannie Mae, but to help you know, convene everybody across the industry. So providing our research helps the dialogue about climate change. And so we put out as much research as we can on topics such as you know, understanding of what the impacts to mortgage performance is post-hurricane, as well as, you know, as I talked about, consumer understanding of flood is one that we'll uh, put out again here soon. So I guess one of the lessons here is always keep your mission in mind when undertaking this type of discovery and disclosure. Yeah, to us it starts with is a borrower able to stay in their house or is their rental property safe? If that happens, the risk takes care of itself. And so we always start with the mission of understanding not only each individual's, but also understanding, quite honestly, what's happened in vulnerable communities. Because we know the historical investment in some communities has not been the same. So we lean in a lot on 
what can we do to bring more investment to certain parts of the United States which have been historically underinvested? Some great insight. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Tim Judge is the Senior Vice President and Head of Modeling and Chief Climate Officer at Fannie Mae. I'm Tom Temin. You're watching Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Aon Consulting.